My name is Gary Kent, for any of you who are just showing up. And I've been the North Carolina coordinator for the Zeitgeist Movement for about the last two and a half years. Uh, I'm the main person who maintains the Zeitgeist North Carolina website. If any of you have joined there, uh, you've probably seen some of the posts that I've made and most of the stuff that's on the front page I'm responsible for. So I take the blame. And uh, what I want to talk about today is mostly about what I've learned over the past two and a half years, really plunging deeply into this train of thought that is the zeitgeist movement. And what I've sort of extracted out of that, the, the key issues, the key points that seem to elude people for quite a while when they become involved in the movement in the first place. So uh, maybe I can help move that forward by uh, sharing my insights. Okay, <clears throat> probably the most important aspect about the Zeitgeist Movement is the train of thought that's involved in, in these understandings. The movement itself is not that important. It's just secondary. It's, it's, it's been created in order to make, uh, make it easier for people who have begin to have these understandings like you and I to share these ideas uh, around the world. Uh, and as soon as these ideas catch on and we begin to move in that direction, then the Zeitgeist Movement has served its purpose, will no longer exist. So it has no intrinsic value as a movement itself. It's just in order to create the cultural zeitgeist or the cultural shift in values. So the, one of the most valuable resources for doing that is this uh, TZM orientation guide. And uh, there have been recently, they have been being updated, the, the global uh, team has been working on updating the essays on here. And they've got about, uh, I think 12 essays posted at this point already of the new, the new orientation guide. And I can't encourage people enough to read these things. These are very scholarly works. They are annotated. They have footnotes. They have all kinds of references and books and stuff where you can learn more about any aspect of it that you don't understand. So I would encourage people to check this out either from the global website or from our Zeitgeist North Carolina website and read all these essays because you're going to, it's going to be an education for you. I, every time I read one of these things, I learn new things. And if I read it again, I learn more stuff. There's just a lot to think about and a lot to understand about this. And uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to try to do is try and distill out some of the most critical points today and share those here. <clears throat> this is just the first page of this <clears throat> orientation guide. These are some of the other essays, Defining Public Health, which is one that Matt just read, and he's going to give his presentation on after this, after I do my presentation. But each one of these is pretty much a doctoral thesis in and of itself. Each one of these essays is very powerful and is, uh, is based on extrapolating these, this understanding, this train of thought, the scientific worldview for solving the problems, the technological uh, ability we have to create a better world, uh, and how that can come about and the cultural problems that are, that are prohibiting that from happening. So that's what the value uh, system disorder is about. Structural classism, the state war, we just saw a video related to that that Peter Joseph did. There's lots of ways of presenting these ideas. Uh, Peter's fabulous because he tries to find creative ways to express this, and uh, he does a really incredible job of it. It's amazing what one person can do. I mean, he's pretty much responsible for starting this whole movement. So the third part, which they haven't really finished these essays yet, but it'll be about sustainability and a new train of thought. And uh, they're working on these now. Uh, Peter's one of the big contributors to these essays, but there are a lot of people from the global team that are brilliant men, brilliant minds. That's one of the things that originally attracted me to the movement is that the people involved in this are really brilliant in their understandings about this stuff. They don't, they don't miss much. And so they, uh, you know, the insights that I get from reading what they do and watching their lectures and, and reading the essays that they put together is, is profound. I've been going through a lot of changes over the past two and a half years in my own understandings and my own values. And the part four is about the Zeitgeist Movement itself. It's understanding the collapse, the revolution of values that has to happen, engaging the group mind. The group mind is an interesting concept that I'm not sure everybody's familiar with or understand. But uh, basically, the group mind idea is related to, to things like uh, when I mentioned before that there have been 15 people that have lived on this planet prior to us. We've inherited from them 
a mind, a set of understandings that's part of the group mind that we have. And that group mind is what creates, has allowed us to create this culture, this civilization that we have right now. So that's our inheritance. And there's no way that that can be taken from us. And this is continuing to evolve. The group mind is continuing to evolve. And what we're doing as part of the zeitgeist movement is beginning, is, is, is part of that evolutionary process. So the transition from where we're at now, uh, transition is one of the big issues that's talked about a lot throughout the zeitgeist movement. Uh, transition is basically how we get from here to where we want to be. And there are <clears throat> as many ideas about that as there are people involved in the movement. So uh, that's an open-ended discussion, and nobody really knows which way it's going to go. We won't know until we get there. TZM structure and processes. Um, this a lot of people that become originally involved in the movement don't understand quite how, how big a structure there is behind the scenes in the Zeitgeist movement. There are probably half a dozen or a dozen different major websites that promote the ideas of the Zeitgeist movement, in, including uh, uh, the uh, technology website, which I can't think of the name of right now. It's uh, uh, Zeit News. And uh, a lot of other... Uh, groups like uh, LTI, which is the literary team, which spun off of the group site but is actually doing work for the Venus Project and some other movements as well right now. They translate videos uh, and uh, essays and documentaries and all types of things into any language, all the languages in the world to spread this information around. Uh, it's a global effort and I've been told right now that they've actually got a lot of volunteers that are working on this. And uh, you know, this is a global effort that's going on. It's not just this country and the English language that needs to spread these ideas. It's being translated. That's one of the things that volunteers are doing. Uh, there's uh, the global lecture team. Uh, there's, um, these are just groups on the global level. And then you have all the state chapters, like the North Carolina state chapter. And you have nation chapters, like there's a US chapter. We have meetings. We pass information back and forth, and we find ideas that are working, like uh, the, one, the Delhi One Project, One Planet Project that you saw earlier tonight, earlier today. Uh, that's a project that came out of one of the Canadian chapters and has begun to spread around the world. And chapters all over the world are starting to use it to spread these understandings. So there's uh, there's a huge structure that's behind this, and a lot of people. <clears throat> I think there are a certain amount of people that are active to one degree or another. But already, there are a huge amount of people that have come into contact with these ideas at least once, and sometimes more than once, that are sympathetic to these ideas, even though they may not totally understand them. And they're out there. And when they see, you know, they're the ones that are kind of waiting on the sidelines to see what's going to happen. And when they see something really important start to occur along these lines, then they're going to come out. We're going to see them come out of the woodwork, I think. I see that all the time. I come across people like uh, the two folks that are here video videotaping uh, uh, our show tonight, uh, uh, Nicholas and uh, where's the other fellow? I don't know his name. He came with him. But they, uh, we just contacted them indirectly through, through, uh, through Steve. And uh, they agreed to come out and videotape the show today so that we can put it up online afterwards. And they've done this totally uh, on a voluntary basis. And it turns out that the, one of the reasons he is interested in doing this is because he's, uh, he's into the Zeitgeist movement. He, he knew about it, but he never knew there was such a thing as the Zeitgeist movement. He'd seen some of the movies, and he liked the ideas. And he came out to do this for us. So anyway, that's real quickly that. So now <clears throat> the TZM train of thought is really the essence of what this is all about. And the idea is that there is a near empirical train of thought that defines our purpose and approach. And it is a simple to share, but it's complex in its understanding. But probably this is, these are the points that I've sort of distilled out of this after two and a half years. The first, and probably one of the most important, is that it has become technically possible for humanity to provide all the basic necessities of life for every man, woman, and child on the planet. That's a big idea. And it's something that, you know, I think that 20, 30, 40 years ago, I kind of felt like that's what America was all about, that our purpose was eventually to raise the standard of living all across the planet so that that would happen. And at some point along the line, I began to realize that that's not what was going on at all. We were going in a totally different direction. And uh, I think it's really important to understand that technically, this is possible at this point in time already. We could do this if we chose to as a group, all humans together, everywhere, without nations, 
without races, without religions, we could do this. Very important point. The second probably most important point to understand about the Zeitgeist Movement and what we're trying to share, the train of thought, is the fact, is the idea that what's blocking this implementation of this possibility is a lot of obsolete ideas, attitudes, institutions, and value sets that drive from, supports, and maintains them are what presently makes implementing these solutions impossible. And that is what we term in the Zeitgeist Movement the value system disorder that we have. And it's basically a disconnect between the values that we have and the requirements that we have in terms of just sustaining life on this planet and indefinitely into the future, sustainably. The third thing that derives from the Zeitgeist Movement is what we do about this. Once we have these first two understandings, what can we do about it? The Zeitgeist Movement approach to addressing these, this problem is a broad educational effort aimed at introducing new ideas into the cultural dialogue and drawing attention to the obsolete ideas that presently dominate and generate the unsustainable values we presently see manifesting as detrimental to the long-term survivability of humanity. The immediate goal is systemic value shift or a zeitgeist movement to make possible the implementation of economic solutions to human needs harmonious with our natural environment. So that's the gist of it. Those three points are probably the core of what the zeitgeist movement is about, in my opinion. Now, this is strictly my extract from this, and probably if you asked another activist, they'd say something else. But this is what I've gathered. <coughs> OK, and, and this leads me to another understanding about this that I wanted to sort of fo focus on and share with people today, because sharing these understandings is about sharing ideas. And these ideas are, are memes, as they're called, are probably the critical thing that go to make up the whole value set. The memes that exist, and this is from Wikipedia, a meme is an idea, behavior, style that spreads from person to person within a culture. A meme acts as a unit for carrying cultural ideas, symbols, or practices, which can be transmitted from one mind to another through writing, speech, gestures, rituals, or other imitable phenomena. Supporters of the concept regard mem memes as cultural analogs to genes in that they self-replicate, mutate, and respond to selective pressures. So memes are these ideas that we live with and work with every single day of our lives. The problem is that we have a lot of memes. There are certain memes within us that we never examine. And thus some of those memes have become so outdated at this point in time that they're creating these structural problems that we have. Or they're creating this value system disorder. Probably the most important meme that we're going to be talking about or focusing on today is the meme that I call money. And money is basically an idea. It's nothing more than an idea. Before we came up with the idea, it didn't exist on the planet. Most of the planet still doesn't use money, only human beings use money to survive. So money is not necessary. And we need to understand that at a really profound level. And we need to understand what the meme of money is and what it, what it leads us to do, what it creates, what derives from the meme of, of money, the idea of money. <clears throat> OK, what happens with the memes is that we, from the time we're born, we begin to inherit these memes from the people around us. These memes become part of our learning process. We inherit them from the people that teach us. They're our parents. We inherit them from the environment around us. We learn them just from interactions with our environment, with other kids. And those memes become part of our, cultural, our personal value set. We create a set of beliefs about the world based on those memes that we, we generate. And those memes end up creating this personal value set that determines the way we interact with the world and the way we respond to the world. It's what we expect to see and it's how we're going to respond in any given situation is determined by those values that we, we internalize, those memes that we internalize within ourselves. And one of the reasons I'm focusing on this is that the memes, these ideas, is what the Zeitgeist movement as a whole is addressing directly because we're, we're trying to inject 
We're trying to do two things. We're first off trying to bring attention to the memes that exist right now that are causing so many problems in culture. And we're trying to inject a new set of memes into the culture that people can begin to absorb and make part of their personal value sets. So these personal value sets that we have, when we, as a whole, create these personal values and share them one person to another, we generate a culture. And this cultural value set that exists is a result of all the individual memes that are created by the individuals. Zeitgeist, by the way, if anybody doesn't, under, doesn't know the term, means the spirit of our time is the translation for that. It's a German term. And is uh, basically, when we talk about the zeitgeist movement, it's changing the cultural climate of, this, of, uh, of humanity. That's what the zeitgeist movement is about. Our name is a reference to the purpose of our existence, to create a value shift within society or a movement of the zeitgeist. To be more specific, it is our mutually understood goal to create a value shift away from our present self-destructive expressions towards a healthier, more sustainable society. Now, the value system disorder that uh, you've already seen referred to several times today, the present value system disorder is the disharmony that exists between the modern zeitgeist and the natural world to which we belong and upon which we depend. It is the source of most unsustainable behaviors within society. Like I said before, our values derive from a personal value set that we have. And the personal value set goes to create the cultural value set. And the cultural value set basically is the way we react. In any given situation, in any circumstance, when we go to work each day, when we, uh, when we interact with somebody in the store, when we interact with our children, we're sharing, we're responding in a way that's within the context of the cultural value set that we've absorbed, the memes and ideas that we have that make up that system. So when we're raised from birth to believe that money is universal, everybody uses money, and that's the way it goes. Kids don't have a concept of money. We have to create that in them. At some point along the way, we have to introduce them to the idea of money. And I think that most people don't understand how problematic that is to the cultural problems that we're facing today. And that's what I'm going to try to emphasize or point out by this talk. For, for, for civil, human civilization to continue, we must begin to harmonize the cultural value set with the immutable laws of our natural world. We must find a way to heal the value system disorder that plagues our modern civilization. Now the chain of causality, now this is something that's an important concept that also runs throughout the zeitgeist movement. When we talk about the scientific method and the train of thought, we're recognizing the chain of causality behind existence. That's the way science works. It recognizes that there's a cause and effect relationship in things because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do anything with it. If you can't predict from a cause what the effect is going to be, then there's no point in trying to do science. There's no point in trying to do much. So there's, there's a chain of causality. And the same thing exists in the world of memes, in the world of ideas. There's a chain of causality that is in, in effect that's determining the way people are behaving as, at large in society. Memes spread from person to person within society in a man manner similar to the way in which genes are spread. The interaction of all memes that an individual has acquired throughout their life, consciously or unconsciously, create their personal value set. Their value set, their personal value set, interacts with and combines with the personal value set of everyone with whom they interact on any level, creating the cultural value set. How do we change the zeitgeist? Modifying or introducing new memes into the cultural dialogue is the only way to create a cultural value shift. All other behaviors will continue to express the same memes, which will generate the same inevitable behaviors and consequences. Shifting memes can be accomplished by self-examination and or by imitation. So when we kick out all the rotten politicians, or we end the Federal Reserve System, or we do any number of other things that, we, that people propose to do today to try and fix the system the way it exists, all those things don't change anything because they don't change the cultural value set. They don't change the memes that are everything. You kick those politicians out, there's going to be a new set in, in two months, doing the same things, creating the same actions because they have the same value set when they come in. 
The same is with the central banks and the Federal Reserve System. We kicked the central, reserves, the central reserve system out of this country when we founded it in the beginning. Since that time, it's been recreated and demolished three times throughout our history. And each time it's come back. The last time was in 1918 with the Federal Reserve Act. And it seems to be here to stay, at least for the moment. And it's not going to help anything to get rid of it, because inevitably, as long as we exist within the monetary system, it's going to be back again. So this idea here at the bottom about shifting, shifting memes can be accomplished by two things. And I think this is important, because one of the things also that the Zeitgeist Movement emphasizes is questioning everything. And this is part of the scientific method as well. You have to question everything about our society, about our culture, about your own values. Examine them, find out where they come from, and examine why you're feeling the way you do, why you react the way you do. When somebody says something to you and you have an immediate reaction, why do you react that way? That's based on the ideas that you've sort of coalesced within yourself and may not have examined clearly enough to understand where that's coming from, what's where that's deriving from. So it's possible to begin that shift by a intimate personal self-examination of your own values and also by imitation. So groups like this where we start to begin to share ideas about values, that also becomes possible. Humans are one of the, the big capabilities we have as human beings. Probably one of the, the most basic things about human beings is that we like to imitate. We have an empathic nature. And so we pick up from other people what we see around them. So when you live in a culture where everybody uses money and that's what they, their whole life is centered around, then you pick that up by natural, natural, that's by our nature to do that. So we need to become very consciously aware that that's what's happening, that that's a problem in order to be able to change it. This is not going to be an easy thing. Nobody ever said it's going to be easy. It's just necessary. OK, so here's some memes that contribute to the value system disorder that we currently have. And these are things that are broadly accepted by society as just normal and natural. Money, property, ownership, competition, profit, separation, labor in exchange for money, endless consumption. All these things go part and hand in hand with our monetary system, with the idea of money. And I hope that I can make that clear before we finish this little talk, that, that all these ideas derive from the very simple, basic idea of money, of exchanging value with another person for something that you do in terms of labor. That's where money came from in the first place, changing labor for value. It's not how it acts in the world today, because the world has changed substantially. But that's where it started from. And everything else is derived from that idea. The only reason you acquire money of anybody is because you don't trust them. If you trusted that you were going to get value back for whatever you do for them, then you wouldn't necessarily require them to give you money in exchange for what you do. You would think, well, if I benefit them, it's going to benefit me anyway. So I don't, you know, I'm not worried about it. You just give it. You give. You share. So when we require money in exchange, any type of money, and I'm going to talk more in detail about different types of money in a minute. But any time we require money, it's basically an act of distrust with another human being. It separates us from each other. It doesn't recognize the unity that we have within us as, a, as human beings, as part of a race of, that has a group mind of which we all are part, in which we all belong, and to which we all inherit much of our understanding about the world. So that's a really core understanding, I think, that a lot of people overlook. I mean, one of the big, when I first became involved in the, in the movement here in North Carolina, there were all kinds of people that wanted to do, uh, that were involved in the movement itself, that wanted to do all kinds of monetary reforms. They felt like that was the step that we needed to take, that we would move forward if we did that. All we had to do was end the Federal Reserve Bank, or end debt-based monetary system, or all these other approaches that they had. If we could just do that, then that would work. Or if we start some type of transition town economies, where we have local currencies and stuff like that, that that would solve the problems. And people still talk about all those things a lot. But I think they fail to, to understand, and I've you know, spent a lot of time discussing this with people, and you know, with at great length and sometimes hardly, about why money itself and the idea of money, the very core idea of money, is really 
the seed that begins all the problems because it is this sense of separation between two individuals in any situation that creates the foundation of all the competition, the schism, and everything that happens. So I'll probably keep saying that over and over again. I can't emphasize that enough because a lot of people have a hard time grasping that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about monetary classism and the meme of money. Money is an idea, strictly an idea. Now there are many types of currency. Currency is just the material expression of money, the idea of money. When we talk about money, we tend to talk about call everything money, but really those other things we call money are mostly currencies. Money is the idea. Money is an abstract thing. The currencies, there are all different types of currencies. We have uh, resource-based currencies. So you have things like gold, silver, wheat, oil. Those are resources and those are exchanged for value with people. <coughs> we have resources that are called fiat. We have uh, currencies that are called fiat currencies, which is what money is today. That we use the, the paper currency that we use is fiat currency. Um, fiat currency is basically any currency that's backed by uh, some type of guarantee. It's a promise of faith on somebody's part that that is worth value. In the case of the American currency and the American dollar, it's backed by the faith, the faith of the American government and nothing else at this point in time. It used to be backed by resources, so it used to be a resource-based currency and a fiat currency, but we went off the gold standard in 1971 for the final time. Since that time, it's basically just a fiat currency, so it's only backed by the faith and goodwill, good, good efforts of the American government. Um, there's also debt-based currencies. And I'm, I'm listing these separately, and there's a very good reason for this, because I'm trying to enumerate the, the main qualities of currencies that I've come to understand as I've come to understand them. Debt-based currencies are any currencies that are, that are created and have to be paid back, have to be in some way compensated for. So most of the currency that we have in circulation, as well as being a fiat currency today, is also debt-based currency. Because when they, that currency is created by the banks when they make loans to people. They make a loan to somebody and you're required to pay that back. And you're not only paid, uh, required to pay back the, uh, the primary part of that debt, you're also uh, required to pay back interest on that debt. So it's a debt-based currency and that's why most of the currencies in the world, around the world right now, are debt-based currencies. That's why the whole planet is basically up to its neck in debt. Every nation in the world is in debt at this point in time. And this debt pyramid is one of the things, this is basically a pyramid scheme, and it's one of the things that's a, on the verge of collapsing globally at this point. And all the, all the highfalutin financial bigwigs around the world are scrambling to try and salvage this system at the moment. And they're doing everything they can to keep it afloat. But I don't think it'll go on for too much longer. It's gonna end. And then we have electronic currencies, like bitcoins. How many are familiar with bitcoins? A few people have heard of bitcoins. A bitcoin is uh, strictly electronic currency. And actually, the money that we use today, even though we call it fiat currency and paper currency, most of it, like uh, I think 98% of the currency that we use in circulation today is actually digital currency in and of itself. It only exists in the computer and the ethernet, in the, in the internet. It's only digits on a computer somebody in, somewhere in some bank or some central banking computer. And uh, uh, Bitcoins is a, a new kind of currency that's been introduced recently that is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, currency that you can use and do a total end run around the banking system the way that it exists today. And there's a lot of hype around it, a lot of people that are pushing it because they think it's the next salvation, like ending the Federal Reserve, the world's falling down all around me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, they think that this, this currency is going to allow us to do a total end run about the bank, around the banking system so that we can avoid taxes from governments, we can avoid all kinds of debt-based uh, uh, currencies, interactions, and uh, you can just basically make a, a transfer of money between two individuals through a computer network in a secure fashion. Uh, they've actually increased in value. They're, they're on, a sky, on a 
on a uh, exponential curve right now in terms of the growth of the value of the bitcoins. So it's another monetary thing that's going on. And uh, in spite of the fact that people think this is maybe the salvation that we've been looking for, it's going to create the same problems that money does in the first place. And they've overlooked that fact. <laughs> because it's still based on the idea of exchanging something with somebody because you don't trust them. That's what it comes down to. So and then we have paper currencies. You know, paper currencies like... Um, you know, fiat currencies can be paper, but they can be other things. And that's the thing about all these types of currencies <coughs> is that there can be any combination of these currencies. And a lot of the currencies we use, we use are more than one type. Some of them are resource-based and fiat currency. Some of them are debt-based and fiat and paper currency. Some of them are electronics or all four. So all, you know, all of these qualities can exist in the money that we use. And people don't understand the intricacies of the currencies, and that's what they get confused about. And they can pretty much ignore that stuff when they start to understand it's the idea of money that's the problem. It's not the currencies where the problem exists. The currencies have their own problems in and of themselves and create various aspects of those problems that sometimes intensify and worsen the situation. But it's really money itself that's the core problem and the idea of money. Let me move this table up just a little bit so we can get this in focus here. This one, this one here. Oh, right there, maybe. Okay. What did, what did you call that earlier bill, or, uh, Gary? Uh, the, the Ethernet? Yes. The Ethernet, yeah. yeah. I think I like that better. <laughs> than the Internet? Yes, the Ether as in F. <laughs> Yeah. The opposite of corporal. Yeah. Yes. It's discorporate, yes. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's what some people are having difficulty with bitcoins right now because there's nothing you can ever hold in your hand right. in relationship to it. So a lot of the people, the big financial people that are in power right now are, are having difficulty accepting it. However, it's starting to catch on because it's probably the most efficient means of, of monetary exchange for online businesses. And of course, many of our businesses are going online right now. Things like Amazon and you know eBay and stuff like that. So more and more of the commerce is happening through the internet. So things, something like Bitcoin. I mean, there are others like it, but Bitcoin is the most popular one right now. But other electronic currencies are probably going to come into vogue pretty soon. And really, they're going to ac accelerate the problems we have. So what's going to be the result? So here, I, I talked about this already several times. Maybe I don't need to reiterate it, but <clears throat> this is a study that's done about estimating how many people have ever lived. And uh, it shows that 107 billion people have been alive on the Earth at one planet or another, according to the best estimates, of which only 7 billion people are alive right now. So when you think about all the value that these 107 billion people created, what happened to it? Did you get any of it? Not much, huh? Well, actually, you did, because everything that we have out in culture and society right now, we inherited from those people. The fact that we can feed everybody on this planet several times over right now is our inheritance. We're just not, we're not having equal access to it. And all the other technologies and the understandings that we've inherited is part of our inheritance. That's part of the group mind that's come down to us, just being human beings on this planet and being born at this time. So memes and evolution, all memes that are introduced into our group mind derive from our connection and interaction with the natural world. The natural world drives evolution. It is the persistence of outdated memes when the environment has evolved that create the disharmoni disharmonious value system disorder. Awareness and the introduction of new memes that better reflect present environmental conditions are what creates a healthy cultural evolution or zeitgeist movement. So if we responded to the, the new ideas as they came along and let go of all the things that became obsolete, we wouldn't have any problems. But that's not what we're doing. Everybody's so steeped in tradition and the traditional ideas. I mean, most people, a lot of people believe, you know, the Bible is the absolute word of God. I mean, they're running from a textbook that's over 2,000 years old. And the society has changed a lot since that time. So there are a lot of things like that that, uh, that are interfering with our ability to move forward. 
It's not that everything in the Bible is wrong. There's lots of wonderful things in there. It's just that there's a lot of it that's way out of date and needs to be updated substantially. <coughs> okay, the main, you'll hear this a lot within the movement. And this is basically, again, the idea about how we have the technological capabilities of solving most of the problems that we have in the world today by applying the scientific method for social concern. The most effective method of introducing new means into the cultural dialogue and of updating our understandings of ourselves and our environment has been the scientific method. The scientific method applied to our cultural value set is what can ultimately cure the present, present value system disorder and create a healthy, vibrant, sustainable civilization in harmony with the natural world. The systemic application of science to our, eco our economy, economic and cultural value set leads us naturally towards a resource-based economy. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about human nature because this is a big one that comes up too. You can talk about these, these ideas sometimes to your blue in the face to people and they say, yeah, but you know, the problem is not money, the problem is that people are greedy. That's a big one. <clears throat> I've thought a lot about this and I've studied as much as I can about it and these are basically the conclusions that I've come to. <clears throat> Human nature is a lot more simple than that and a lot more versatile than that. People can be expressive of greed. They can be expressive of a lot of different things. They can be expressive of violence. They can be expressing, expressive of great generosity. Uh, but can I get a little more water? Yeah. <coughs> oh. But those things are not human nature. Human nature is such that we're able to adapt and, and, and exhibit those behaviors because of who we are at a more fundamental level. So these are the things that I've come to understand <coughs> that is, are really true, truly human nature. There, there are probably many others, but uh, these are probably some of the big ones. Human beings are empathic. How many of you have heard about or read a book called The Empathic Civilization by Jeremy Rifkin? Anybody? It. It's a wonderful book. If you have a chance to read it, I highly suggest it. One of the things he talks about, and there is some recent research that's been done about human beings. In particular, they put electrodes on people, and then they observe behaviors that they do in terms of, like, uh, <clears throat> say, swinging a baseball bat. And they found that when they, it's on the prefrontal cortex, which is you know, part of the brain, I think it's the prefrontal cortex, which part of the brain that the human beings have in exclusion to the other animals on the planet. And they found that when you, when you do something like swing a bat, there's a certain pattern of activity that appears in the brain like that. And they found that also, not only when you swing the bat, but if you just think about swinging the bat, the same pattern of activity occurs in the brain. Not only that, but when you look at another human being and you watch them swing a bat, the same pattern of activity occurs in your brain. So that's our empathic nature. That's how we learn from each other. That's human nature. That's a basic characteristic of human nature. It's the, the problem is the things that we tend to learn and tend to take into ourselves as memes that become the values that we express. That's why we become greedy or some of the other values that we're expressing in the world today that are called being so, so, so destructive. <clears throat> we're also very social creatures. Human beings need other people. Uh, Peter Joseph is very fond of saying that if a child is born and is never handled, never touched, they'll die before very long. We have to be touched. We have to have communion with other human beings. We have to have relationships. We're social beings. So that's part of human nature. We're also tool makers. Technology is a direct result of being a human being. There are other animals that also use very rudimentary technologies, but human, human beings, at least on this planet, are the, the pinnacle of the expression of technology, of the, of the uh, tool maker mindset. We have created a vast technology that has allowed us to uh, <clears throat> utilize the resources on the planet in a much more efficient manner than we've ever been able to do in the past. 
So that, that is another aspect that's, that's human nature in and of itself. And this idea of the group mind <coughs> that we've been talking about, this is something that's pretty abstract to a lot of people, but I think this is really important. Because this is something that we inherit from generation to generation. It has to do with our empathic nature. It has to do with our social nature. And the result is this group mind arises that is sort of the communal inheritance of, of human beings. Unfortunately, right now, the monetary system is one of those things that we've inherited and that we express from generation to generation. It's so ancient that we almost never even consider it. We never think about it. And that's one of the big problems. That's why we need to bring attention to it right now, since it's the core of the problems that we're facing. Because we need to begin to change it. We need to find another way to do things. So the group mind, our capacity to create and share memes, retain and sharing memes as part of human nature, not the memes themselves, not the ideas, but the idea of the ability to share memes from generation to generation is definitely part of human nature. Memes are, change or <coughs> are changeable under involving environmental influences. I talked about that a little bit earlier <coughs> in terms of, and this is the big change that I see, and this is related to money and the idea of money. When we started, the idea of money began in some unknown historical time. It derived from the fact that we lived in an environment that was basically abundant in resources. We had lots and lots of everything around. We just didn't have enough people to exploit that to any great extent. So we were hunter-gatherers at first, and we gathered what we needed, and really pretty much everybody shared everything. I mean, I don't think when there's a huge herd of deer and somebody kills one, everybody's going to fight over that one deer <coughs> when there's all these other deer out there they could go get if they need to. So that's not where the problems arose in terms of money. We also had, because there were very few people on the planet, there was not a lot of human labor to exploit the resources we had. So when we started moving to an agricultural society where we need divisions of labor, that's where the idea of money began to come in. So it was basically, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that there was a, an abundant resource society and a scarcity of human labor. That environment that we were raised in that gave rise to the idea of money, which was a very useful idea for us at that time and has led eventually to the civilization that we have today, there was nothing wrong with that. But now the environment has changed substantially, partially because of the nature of the world itself and, and the nature of the amount of resources we have, which is limited on this planet, and partially because of human innovation, technology. We've created a place where we have 7 billion people on the planet. We have lots of human labor. But not only that, we don't need the human labor we have anymore because we've created through technology all kinds of ways of, of implementing, uh, of, of providing for ourselves without the use of human labor. And you've seen that again and again in some of these videos we've done today. We keep, you know, there's not that many points about this. It's not that hard a concept. It's just there's a lot of resistance when you start talking to people about it. The core ideas are pretty simple. So uh, that big environmental shift from where money was founded to the time we are today, where we have basically a resource scarcity and a labor abundance, is the reason that money has become a problem. The way money expresses in the world today is generating all the problems that we see around us in one form or another. Poverty, environmental degradation, uh, war, hunger, starvation, uh, social problems, you know, ill health, the fact that we all have to work when we don't really need to, uh, just in order to make a living, in order to earn money to live. Uh, so many different things. It's just so pervasive, it's hard to express in just a few words. But it's, when you start looking into it, you start to understand how this has happened. And the thing we need to do, basically, is be able to start moving towards a place where we can move past the idea of money and separation and towards a place where we can share. And the ideal would obviously be to begin with the sharing of all the worth, you know, of the Earth's resources, declaring the world's resources as the, uh, as the common heritage of all humanity, and begin to use those to provide the basic necessities of life. That's one of the core principles or the ideas behind a resource-based economy. At core, it's a basic idea of sharing. And you can't share when there's money involved. Money involves not sharing. So what's not human nature? <clears throat> Just about everything else, as far as I can tell. Behaviors that are generated by the interaction of the personal value set with the environment. 
So we have a personal value set. We have a set of beliefs. We have a set of memes that we've taken in upon of ourselves. And then we react in certain ways as a result of those ideas that we have, that we've thought of. This is what I am. This is the way I am. I am an American. I am a patriot. I am a, you know, anything. I'm a North Carolinian. It doesn't matter. All those things are memes or ideas that we take into ourselves. They're not part of human nature. But those determine the way we react. That's why we vote for the, that's why we root for the teams we root for when it comes to sports, because you're born in a certain state. It's not because that team is better than any other team, but that's just our behaviors. Our behaviors are dictated by the memes that we take in and identify with as being ourselves. So things like greed, aggression, property, isolated individuality, the list is pretty endless. But those are ideas that derive from the, the meme of money. That's where they come from. It is our capacity to adapt and change, adapt to a changing environment that enables us to survive. <coughs> Conditioned habits that inhibit healthy ad adaptation create unnecessary suffering by hindering our ability to quickly adapt to rapidly changing environmental influences, driven either by human nature or human development. Not by human nature, but by nature or human development. <coughs> OK. Let's pick it up a little bit here. Now I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give an example of some of these ideas that I've been talking about. I'm a mailman. This is what I do for a living. I've been doing it for the, more than 20 years now. You probably all know about the problems the Postal Service is having. I think this is a wonderful example of what's happening to our culture as a whole, because it's exactly the same thing that's going on. Uh, these are 2012 statistics for the post office. <coughs> Pretty much this is not all that important. Uh, probably one of the most important things to note here is there's 574,000 people that are employed by the Postal Service. Until a few years ago, the Postal Service was the big civilian employer in the United States. Employed more employees than any other business. It's been surpassed by Walmart now and a few others. Uh, the military has always been bigger, but that number has started to decrease pretty rapidly in recent years. This is the historical record of the blue line shows the number of employees the post office has since 1920 sometime up through 2012. And you can see what happened when I started working for the post office in the early 1990s, which is right around in here. The post office had just started implementing a lot of automation. They started automating the mail processing. So when I first started working, I was in one of the backwater mail offices in the post office. And I used to come in every day, and we'd stand at the case for, for a couple hours, two or three hours every day, and case mail into slots for the deliveries that we were going to make. We'd put letters and flats into the case. And we had trays and trays of these things, feet and feet. And we'd have to stand there and do that until we were done. When we were done, we'd pull it all down, put it in trays, get in our truck, and go out and deliver it. Well, right around that time when I started working, they had started the automation process, so they started automating the mail sorting. So now, when I walk into the post office, I have three or four trays of mail that are already sorted in delivery sequence order for me. It's done by machines. So a lot of the people that used to do all that sorting were no longer needed, because the machines do it. So that's part of what happened to the post office. That's why they started cutting down employment back in this time. The, the amount of people they needed was dropped way down in the first uh, part of 1990, late 80s and 90s, because of the automation, internal automation of the post office. What they didn't pay attention to was the fact that other things in our society were becoming automated around the same time, like the internet. The internet hit, and email came along. And email automated part of the mail processing that they didn't expect. It automated the actual delivery of letters, totally. So they didn't need to sort anything anymore. First class mail volume started to drop off. That's what you see in the red line up here. And it's probably around 2000, it started dropping off pretty sharply. And you see the rate of drop off has been huge right now. And it's still spreading because in a lot of places, the internet has not even become that active yet in this country. But it's increasing very rapidly. And the internet is a much better way, email is a much better way to deliver a letter almost all the time than using the post office. I mean, it's inevitable that this is going to happen. So it's two forms of automation, two forms of technology that have impacted the post office directly. It's been the internal automation of the mail processing, the, their particular function of delivering uh, physical letters and packages, 
and the decrease of the need to do mail at all because of email. The result has been a huge drop off in the first class meal volume and you see right now the number of employees being hired by the post office has dropped off from the high which was almost 800,000 people several years back to just a little over 500,000 people now and they're actually saying there are about 200,000 people overemployed at the moment. They want to cut back another 200,000 people. So they're closing post offices, they're trying to cut back on people. This is where, and the reason I bring this out is because I know the post office so well, so I can talk about this. So the projected losses for 2012 for the post office are $14.1 billion. That's how much money we lost. So not only are they cutting back on the amount of employees, they've automated all this stuff, but they're losing money because first class mail volume was how they used to make their income. And we don't have that anymore, it's disappearing. Automation has made the UPS, USPS obsolete. The unions are fighting to preserve jobs that are no longer needed. Management is fighting to preserve a model for meal distribution that has been outclassed by email. Even package delivery will be heavily impacted as new technologies continue to develop towards safer, more efficient driverless vehicles. The impact of technological unemployment are rapidly degrading the foundations of our global economic model. When human labor becomes unnecessary, workers cannot earn money to become consumers. Without consumers, business cannot make profits. If profits drive business activity, where will that leave us? What is forgotten in all the economic turmoil it is, that it is not, that it is not human needs that drive business act, uh, that it is human needs that drive business activities and not profits. And that's what's, that's what's forgotten, that's what's overlooked. I mean, it's a big elephant. It's human needs that drive business activity, it's not profits. The reason we do everything is not for money, whether you think, think, think so or not. A lot of people, that's all they do is they do what they do for money, bankers and stock market brokers and stuff like that. They do things for money. But really, it's human needs that drive all of it. And that's what we have in common with everybody on the planet. And that's what we're going to have to get back to. We're going to have to forget about the stuff that doesn't work and fall back on the things that we do have in common. And that's where we're going to find the common ground and begin to share. OK, profits, money, and the entire monetary sense, uh, system are simply something that we have made up over time to provide for our needs. Our rapidly evolving technological capabilities require us to entirely rethink our methods of providing for these needs. So here again, <clears throat> this is uh, now the American economy as a whole. And at the top we have um, the red is the uh, real domestic gross product. This is how much stuff we're producing is the red line. Uh, the green line <coughs> is the all employees that are involved in producing these things. So you can see there's a growing discrepancy as time goes on here between the amount of employees we need to make the stuff that we need. That's the essence of this graph. The bottom line, <coughs> the blue line is, uh, is uh, non-supervisory employees in the private industries. So. That doesn't include, that's production and non-supervisory employees. That's excluding some of the people that work. But this trend is not going to change. If anything, it's going to, you can see that since the recovery started in 2008 after the big financial drop uh, in the gross domestic product, this has sort of really risen pretty steadily. But you can see that uh, these rates are not increasing anywhere near as fast. And eventually this stuff as technology begins to be implemented, even though it's being hindered to a great extent because of the way ac economic activity unfolds and the need for maintaining profits inhibits a lot of technological applications that we could actually be doing today to improve our, our capabilities. Uh, you know, if that stuff was actually used, this need for employment down here would begin to drop very rapidly even more than it is so already. And another graph, basically the same thing. This is manufacturing, and this shows productive production, industrial production in blue, and the number of employees in red. This trend is, is non-reversible. There's nothing that the present economy can do, the present monetary system can do to change this. 
as this happens and businesses become more and more, the profit starts to be hurt because people don't have any money to buy their things anymore. The first thing they're going to do is look for further ways to automate in order to cut their costs even further. They're going to lay off more people. So they're cutting their own throats. They just don't know it yet. Yeah. This is where we're headed. From resource abundance and labor scarcity to resource scarcity and labor abundance. The continuous expansion of human understanding and its application through science and technology has created a substantial shift in the circumstances and environment of human activity on Earth. If we are to flourish, we must adjust our values to more accurately reflect our expanding capabilities and the inherent limitations, limits imposed upon us by nature. Understanding why and how the values shift must occur is critical to human survival. Helping to create that value shift is the purpose of the Zeitgeist Movement. And I think you just saw this, <laughs> this quote from the end of the last video that we watched, the uh, Culture and Decline video. It's the Buckminster Fuller quote, but it's a wonderful quote. I don't know how many people are familiar with Buckminster Fuller, but he was talking about these ideas 30, 40, 50 years ago. This was already coming down the pike, and people with enough insight and intelligence saw it coming then. And he was one of the forerunners in this. So you ever get a chance to look into his stuff like uh, Critical Path, it's all about this idea that we have the technological capability to provide for all the human needs on this planet in abundance right now at a scale that is unimaginable to most people. <clears throat> War is obsolete. The very idea of money is separation and distrust. You never require money to share with one whom you trust and love. The notion is abhorrent. Either we are one people and one family here on Earth working for our common survival and prosperity, or we will continue to distrust and compete each against all until we destroy ourselves and devastate this beautiful planet that has given us life. Love or fear, sharing or suffering, one planet at peace or many nations at war, in this, there is no compromise. It is th it's for each of us to decide which path we choose and then to have the courage to walk that path each day. Together we will build an incredible future or alone we shall perish. When we dance and sing arm in arm, hand in hand, through the streets and avenues of our cities, in joy, in love, in peace, ready to share all and receive all in return, the future will be ours, a future without money. That's my vision for where we're headed. And that's about it. I'm going to get some questions from people if people have questions they'd like to ask. Anybody have any comments or questions? Or I can take negative feedback, too. That's good. <laughs> hey, actually, I, I have a probably negative, but um, I don't think people realize that those DVDs are free. I mean. Oh, yeah, all the DVDs are free that we're hanging out. actually free and that people should take one. Um, yeah. That's why people are going back and forth and not really like, oh, let me look at the screen for five seconds. Free DVDs. Oh, I got shops. That's free, free, free. I mean, maybe if we tape something to the poll, like. Oh, you mean there's, I know, it says free on there. Does it? Yeah.